As they say, due to technical difficulty, this will be aired at a later time. I want to welcome each of you here today to the service in memory of Jerry Buss. I want to, on behalf of the family, I want to thank all of you for attending today, for being here to remember Jerry's life. Let us pray. Father God, we do give you thanks today, Lord, for the blessings that you bring into our lives, for the love and the care that you have shown to each one of us. Father, we pray today, Lord, is that as we gather here, Lord, that you will remind us of your eternal mercy, of your eternal grace, that we can be forgiven of our sin and can be pronounced clean and can be pronounced a child of God. And we thank you, Lord, today as we think of Jerry's life, that he has made that decision, that he has committed his life to you, and now that he is enjoying life eternal. Father God, we ask your, your comfort to those who grieve, that you will bring hope through the resurrection of Christ, that they will find hope knowing that because Christ was raised from the dead, so shall we be like him. Bless us now, Father, in this time. Amen.
I'm going to share with you some scriptures that bring comfort to us, scriptures from the Old Testament, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. From the book of Job, we find these words in chapter 19. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes and I not in another, how my heart yearns within me. And then these words from Psalm 121, familiar words to us. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Those are the words of the Lord. a secret chord let David play that it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do ya it goes like this the fourth, the fifth the minor fall the major lift I'm baffled by the king who sings hallelujah
I did my best it wasn't much I couldn't feel so I tried to touch I've told the truth I didn't come to fool you and even though it all went wrong I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah morning. I am Mandy Barkhouse and I am Jerry's niece. And April and Crystal, they asked me to read something and this is put together by them and their families and this just just touches on a few of my uncle Jerry's qualities and contributions to the world. So here are their words. Dad is the one we all called when we need someone to come to the rescue. He could carry three grandkids at once. Alex on one side, Joey on the other, Jaylee balanced in the middle. He loved nothing more than to have a baby to hold and was so looking forward to being a great grandpa soon. Grandpa's rescues came in many different forms. Car trouble, call grandpa. Keys locked in the car? Call grandpa. Kids need picked up? Call grandpa. Moving to a new house? Call grandpa. Jaylee told of a time when she was around one year old and she accidentally locked herself in Crystal's bedroom. Jaylee was upset and crying, so Crystal fed her Cheerios under the door to keep her calm until grandpa could come to the rescue. Grandpa got the door open right away. Jaylee waddled out, pouting and sniffling, glared at Crystal, and went straight to Grandpa. Joey remembers a fishing trip with Grandpa at Beaver Lake when a monster storm came up suddenly. Grandpa got all the kids into the clubhouse and ran back out to the dock to get all their stuff. The kids all still refer to this simply as the storm. Even in the storm, no one ever felt safer than when they were with Grandpa. Many of our memories with Dad centered around fishing. Jason talks about Grandpa taking us fishing a lot. Jason liked to go fishing with Grandpa. He caught his first fish with Gram Grandpa and, and, and Grandma took a photo. Grandpa loved to show off that picture. April remembers swimming at Beaver Lake. Dad would pull us out of the lake onto the dock so we didn't have to push off the slimy bottom of the lake with our feet. Grandpa Joe Brat would always have a list of projects at the Beaver Lake house for Dad to work on. And when we visited, which was often, Dad would finish whatever list Grandpa had for them for him, and then we'd go fishing. The biggest catch Dad ever made out at Beaver Lake was when he had to fish Jacqueline out when she fell backwards in her chair off the dock and landed in the lake. Grandpa just reached in and plucked her right out of the water. Alexandra remembers watching cartoons with Grandpa in the mornings before leaving for preschool. She and Jacqueline said that when they would have sleepovers at Grandma and Grandpa's house, Grandpa would get kicked out of bed so they could sleep with Grandma. And Justin remembers Jerry's advice for raising girls, the rule of 25. 
When the girls asked how old they have to be to get their ears pierced, ride their bikes to the park, go to the mall with their friends, drive, go on a date, the answer is always 25. And for the record, it didn't work for Jerry or Justin. Dad loved Husker volleyball and always watched the games. He was very happy to get to go to the record-setting game played in Memorial Stadium and the 2023 match at Devaney when Nebraska beat Wisconsin. When Jack was born, we bought a big comfy recliner. It was a papa chair. Grandpa used it to rock Jack and then Jason too and even slept in it more than once. Most days when Grandpa left, Jack would help hunt for all the loose change under Papa's chair. We had such a pile of change that we had to make a trip to paint yourself silly to make Grandpa his own piggy bank. Crystal remembers this. She says, when I was about 20, I lived in an apartment building that Mom and Dad owned and managed. I had been on my own for a few years and felt pretty independent most of the time. I was doing paperwork one night, well past midnight, and I heard the sound of a mouse trap. I didn't think much of it at first, but wandered over to take a look. And at the first sight of that squirmy little mouse, I called mom and dad, shrieking into the phone. Mom said, Jerry, you better get over there. And dad got in the car and drove across town to take a mouse out of my apartment so I could go to bed. In the years since, Dad has slept on my couch holding a baby so I could take a nap more times than I could count. He rescued me roadside as many times and flew across the country to take care of baby Jason when I had to work and couldn't leave a new baby behind. Dad has always been our rock. And every child and grandchild would say he would stood in front of a train for any, any one of us. Dad didn't say much, but we knew we were loved. It showed in how he cared for mom for so many years without a single complaint, and how he dropped everything to rescue any of us from problems that ranged from the trivial to what felt insurmountable until dad showed up. And his love was never more obvious than in those great big grandpa hugs that we will all dearly miss. Now, I'll just add that my Uncle Jerry was, was the oldest in his nuclear family. And Uncle Jerry had typical characteristics of an oldest child, responsible, probably the most mature out of his siblings. No, not mentioning any names, but you know who you are. <laughs> and my dad said that he didn't always see eye to eye with my Uncle Jerry. But then he said, but my big brother always had my back. And as I reflected on that this week, and I reflected on Uncle Jerry and the life that he had and the people that he impacted, I felt like, isn't that what we want for humanity, to have each other's back? Uh, especially for, for us who call ourselves as followers of Jesus, which Jerry certainly was. So I wonder how we can strive to be there for one another despite our differences and just show up with that unconditional love like Jerry did. When life collides with death, it's hard, especially when it's unexpected. So April and Crystal, I'm going to speak on behalf of all of your cousins and probably others too, but especially your cousins. We are here for you today or tomorrow, next month, next year, any time, we've got your back, and we love you. Thank you, Mandy, for your words and the words of your cousins. I appreciate it very much. It's beautiful. Let us pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we once again come before you, our maker and our creator, our lover, our sustainer, the one who knows every intimate detail about each one of us. And Lord, it's in a time like this that we turn to you for solace, for strength, 
for courage to go on, for joy in the midst of sorrow, we turn to you. And Father, we want to thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, who became our Redeemer, our Savior, dying upon the cross that we can have life and have it abundantly, rising from the dead so that we can have the resurrection for our own bodies, our own selves, as we know that because Christ was raised, we shall be like him. And so, Father, in this time, we, we simply pause to say thank you. Thank you for, for Jerry's life, for the memories that family members have, and for the faith that Jerry passed on to his family. Father God, we ask that you will continue now with, with uh, bringing us uh, peace today, and we ask this in your name. Amen. We turn to some selections from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We find these words in John chapter 11. Jesus is speaking to two grief-stricken sisters upon the death of their brother Lazarus. And Jesus says to them, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then in the 14th chapter of John, we find these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, there you will be also. You know the way to the place where I am going? And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My condolences to each member of the family, to each person who is here today for this very sudden and tragic loss of Jerry. We gathered here just a couple of years ago. Um, I know um, to, to, honor, to honor Judy's life. And I know that you believe in eternal life. You believe in heaven. You believe in Jesus Christ. That we have faith and trust in the Lord that he knows what is right and good with our lives, but nevertheless, loss is hard. It shakes us up. It shakes every aspect of our world when we lose somebody that we love so much. Even Jesus wept when he arrived in Bethany when Lazarus died. Grief is, a, is simply a human emotion that we can't escape. It's, un, it's unfortunate. It's, it's part of life. Grief is necessary. I enjoyed Jerry. I, the first time I got to know him, shortly after I moved here, I think it was about 14 years ago, as we took on the project of replacing the roof, including the trusses and everything that had, had, were literally falling in on one of the houses of our parishioner. And so we gathered a group of, of, of men and women together, and it was a big job, and I can remember uh, being covered with dirt 
And Jerry was out there working away, typical of much the way you described him today, somebody who stepped in when something needed to be done, he was there to help with it. And that was Jerry. Jerry used to go up to Camp Moses Merrill and volunteer for the same exact reason. Doing anything that needed to be done, stepping in, working, and you know, I'm thankful that we've got a couple of guys in the church now that do the same thing. They go up there one day of the week, and they do exactly what Jerry did for, for several years. Today, Jerry is home with the Lord. Was it unexpected? Of course it was. It was a terrible shock. None of us, however, can determine the moment when life is going to leave these fragile bodies of ours. It's out of our control. But what is within our control is to prepare ourselves for, for that moment when death comes. To be spiritually reconciled to our creator God through his son Jesus Christ who died for us. And as a result of being forgiven by Christ, we are also have prepared to go to the place that I read about just a few moments ago that Jesus prepared for those who believe in him. I believe that Jerry looked forward, like many of us do, to going to that place that Jesus spoke of in John 14. And he has reached his final goal. And I guess the question is, could anyone ask for anything more? The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament, also struggled with the same issue. He says, if I'm going to go on living in the body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is even better. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. Imagine being so at peace with God. God's plan for your life, God's direction, that you're actually having a hard time deciding if death is better or if going on living is better. See, the reason this was a hard decision for Paul is because his perspective was so right on. He didn't see death as the end. He saw death as a passageway, as a doorway into living forever. And he knew the key to opening that door was his relationship with Jesus Christ. He had been forgiven of his sin. He was walking with Christ. And he had the key to pass into new life. Now I'm sure you know the scenario of coming home with a a load of groceries from the grocery store and you've got a bags, uh, two bags in each hand and you come to the front door and you reach for your, you feel for the key in the pocket of the, the most free hand. Of course, it's going to be in the opposite pocket or in your purse or whatever. And so you're struggling to find the key to open the door and the first key that you put in doesn't work and then the, they try a different key and, and so it goes. That's kind of the way it is with a lot of people as they live life. They, they, they reach for the key and they say, well, maybe if I do good works, maybe if I do the right, all, all the right things and I treat, each, treat other people well, I do the right thing, that that's going to be the key to opening that door to eternal life. But that key doesn't work in the lock. And others use the key of, of going to church every Sunday but, but you know what? That key doesn't work either because we, we hear the right things at church. It's a place of worship. It's a place of learning about God. But it does not mean that we have made that personal commitment, that we have not asked for forgiveness for our sin and recognize that we need Christ's redemption. The only key that works in the lock for eternity is a key of God's grace, a gift from him. And you know what? There's not a, there's not a uh, keyhole on the outside of the door. It unlocks from the inside. It's God's invitation to us where he opens the door and he says, come on in.
your faith has made you justified. The Bible says that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And when we admit that we are a sinner and we invite Christ into our life, then we will have free access through that door to eternity. Now while each of us this week received some very bad news, when we received the shocking news that Jerry had passed away, I had just chatted with him last Sunday morning on the way out of church. And it was so hard for me to hear those words after the, 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 the very next, uh, or two days later. We were all shocked by that news, but I'm thinking that right now for Jerry, that that's all good news. We don't feel that way, necessarily. It's our loss. But because of his faith in Christ and, and the forgiveness of sin, he is rejoicing in the presence of God right now. He's in the presence of Christ in that place that Christ has prepared for us. And this is the hope that we have. And so as we remember the life of, of Jerry Buss, and as we grieve the loss, may we find solace and hope in the fact that he is with God. Amen. chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God has called me here below and he will be forever
I'm hopeful that you will remain behind today downstairs in our fellowship hall. We have a meal prepared and that this will be a great time for you to be able to connect with family, connect with friends, offer your condolences, and to share in some good food and fellowship around the table. So please, I hope that you plan uh, to stay today. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we do give you thanks for your love, for your protection, for your kindness, and for your grace. For it's that amazing grace, that which was done in our behalf, that we are most grateful for. And so, Lord, we ask that you will dismiss us today with your strength and peace and comfort and hope. Hope of eternal life for those who believe. And, Father, we also ask that you will uh, bless the food that has been prepared to our bodies That as we fellowship around the table today, Lord, that you will be present in the conversation there. We ask this now in your name we pray. Amen. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glorified. Majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, go in God's peace. Amen.